May in A.M.M. is a hot, brooding month. The days are long and humid, the river shrinks and black crows gorge on bright mangoes in still, dust-green trees. Red bananas ripen, jackfruits burst, dissolute blue bottles hum vacuously in the fruity air, then they stun themselves against clear window panes and die, fatly baffled in the sun. The nights are clear but suffused with sloth and sullen expectation. But by early June the southwest monsoon breaks and there are three months of wind and water with short spells of sharp glittering sunshine that thrilled children snatched to play with. The countryside turns in a modest green, boundaries blur as tapioca fences take root and bloom. Brick walls turn moss green, pepper vines snake up electric poles, Wild creepers burst through laterite banks and spill across the flooded roads. Boats ply in the bazaars, and small fish appear in the puddles that fill the PWD potholes on the highways. It was raining when Rahel came back to am and The old house on the hill wore its steep, gabled roof pulled over its ears like a low hat. The walls, streaked with moss, had grown soft and bulged a little with dampness that seeped up from the ground. The wild, overgrown garden was full of the whisper and scurry of small lives. The house itself looked empty. The doors and windows were locked, the front veranda bare, unfurnished. But the sky-blue Plymouth with chrome tail fins were still parked outside, and inside baby Kochima was still alive. She was Rahel's baby grand-aunt, her grandfather's younger sister. Rahel hadn't come to see her, though. She had come to see her brother, Esther. They were two egg twins, born from separate but simultaneously fertilised eggs. Esther Estepan was the older by 18 minutes. Sophie Moll was Esther and Rahel's cousin, their uncle Jachko's daughter. She was visiting from England. Esther and Rahel were seven years old when she died. Sophie Moll was almost nine. She had a special child-sized coffin, satin-lined, Brass handle shined. She lay in it with her yellow crimpling bell bottoms, with her hair in a ribbon and her made in England go go bag that she loved. Her face was pale and as wrinkled as a doby's thumb from being in water for too long. The congregation gathered around the coffin and the yellow church swelled like a throat with the sound of sad singing. The long candles in the altar were bent, the short ones weren't. Amul's hands shook and her hymn book with it. Esther stood close to her, barely awake, his aching eyes glittering like glass. Two weeks later, Esther was returned. Amul was made to send him back to their father, who had moved to Calcutta to work for a company that made carbon black. Esther and Rahel hadn't seen each other since. And now, 23 years later, their father had re-returned Esther. He had sent him back to A.M.M. with a suitcase and a letter. It hadn't changed the June rain. The grass looked wet green and pleased. Happy earthworms frolicked purple in the slush. Green nettles nodded, trees bent. Further away, in the wind and rain on the banks of the river, in the sudden thunder darkness of the day, Estelle was walking. He was wearing a crushed strawberry pink T-shirt, drenched darker now, and he knew that Rahel had come. It had been quiet in Esther's head until Rahel came, but with her she had brought the sound of passing trains and the light and shade that falls on you if you have a window seat. The world, locked out for years, suddenly flooded in, and now Esther can hear himself for the noise. Trains, traffic, music, the stock market, a dam had burst and savage water swept everything up in a swirling. In the old house on the hill, baby Kochama sat at the dining table rubbing the thick, frothy bitterness out of an elderly cucumber. Rahel tried to say something. It came out jagged, like a piece of tin. She walked to the window and opened it for a breath of fresh air. Though you couldn't see the river from the house any more, like a seashell always has a sea sense, the am and m house still had a river sense. A rushing, rolling, fish-swimming sense. 
From the dining room window where she stood with the wind in her hair, Rahel could see the rain drum down on the rusted tin roof of what used to be their grandmother's pickle factory. Paradise pickles and preserves. Perhaps it's true that things can change in a day, that a few dozen hours can affect the outcome of whole lifetimes. Little events, ordinary things, smashed and reconstituted, imbued with new meaning. Still, to say that it all began when Sophie Moll came to AM&M is only one way of looking at it. Equally, it could be argued that it actually began thousands of years ago, long before the Marxists came, long before Christianity arrived in a boat and seeped into Kerala like tea from a tea bag, that it really began in the days when the love laws were made, the laws that lay down who should be loved and how, and how much. <laughs>